everyone, welcome. This is a webinar and workshop about prompt engineering for higher education faculty. My name is Kimberly Becker, and I'm here with my colleague, Jessica Parker. I'm an applied linguist, and so my background is specifically in corpus linguistics. That's how I have a connection to AI. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but my research is primarily in disciplinary academic writing and Gen AI now. And I work with Jessica at Academic Insight Lab, and then I'm also a writing consultant at Midland University for their doctoral students. And I will let Jessica introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Parker. I'm Kimberly's co-founder at Academic Insight Lab. I'm a health sciences educator at the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. I'm an interdisciplinary researcher, including generative AI research. I also own uh, two academic coaching and consulting companies. We work with uh, academics across pretty much all disciplines. And all of that experience of teaching and consulting informs everything that we do at Academic Insight Lab. So we're excited to talk to you today about prompt engineering. We're not computer scientists. We're self-taught. We've learned to prompt through building our AI tools. Ah, thanks. Okay. So a little bit about Academic Insight Lab. So this is our collaborative effort to support scholars at all stages of their work, graduate students, postdocs, professional researchers, faculty members, in with, with AI-based tools. And so the, the basic takeaway that you need to know about what we do is that we create applications that kind of flip the paradigm of generative AI. And instead of really generating content, they do feedback and evaluation. So the, the way that we provide that feedback is through best practices backed by research. We meticulously test them and we have the highest standards of privacy that we can possibly have, which also I'll talk about as we go along. But mostly this is going to be a very general approach to prompt engineering. So just really quickly, what we've been up to lately is related to research on the use of large language models. So ChatGPT, Claude, those kind of chatbots to engage them in research-related writing activities or research-related methodologies. So we published an article about developing and refining interview protocols. We've, we've published some theoretical work on how to think about ethical approaches and responsible access to these models. And then a lot of our work is related to training students and how to use this in, in ways that, that align with the norms of academic integrity. So that's what we've been up to. All right. So for this workshop, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about AI literacy. I think it's really important for everybody to, as AI champions or AI enthusiasts at your university, I'm, our hope is that whatever you learn here, you can take back. But just like we needed to develop technological literacy, this is another aspect of that. So I'll spend some time on that. Then, of course, the main focus is prompt engineering. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about ethics at the end. Okay, so you'll notice that we talk about AI literacies as opposed to literacy. And this actually comes from Selber's 2004 framework. So it's kind of an older model called multiliteracies for a digital age. And within that framework, there are three categories or types of literacy. The first is just a functional literacy. So basic understanding of the tools. What are the tools? What are the applications? What are the use cases? How do we navigate their interfaces, their platforms? Just getting to know what this is and how it works. And then we move on to critical literacy, which is related to evaluating and analyzing the accuracy, the reliability, the validity of AI-generated content, assessing it, and determining really whether we can verify what it outputs. Because as we'll talk about today, and you've probably heard this, they can hallucinate. And so we need to be really aware of that and take that into consideration. There's also a lot of potential for bias because these models are built by humans and humans are innately biased. So we can take some steps to mitigate that, but I don't know that we'll ever be able to overcome that because it's a human problem and that's not something we're likely to solve. And then finally, rhetorical 
literacy is a much deeper way to think about AI literacies. This is when you get into determining maybe the rhetorical patterns, analyzing style, voice, tone, comparing, contrasting, and, and understanding really how AI might be able to shape the world of communication, goals, strategies, that kind of thing. And so for today, with prompt engineering, we really focused on this first level of just functional literacy, understanding these tools, what they do, how they work, because prompt engineering is just talking to them and we can't talk to them unless we know what they do. So with that, we will jump right in to this. You've probably seen this before. This is a really commonly used diagram because we're all trying to learn about this, right? And so what I've done is, because I'm not a computer scientist, I worked together with ChatGPT really early on and I came up with or we came up with an analogy to help people understand what these different levels are. And the analogy is uh, training a dog. Okay. So instead of training a machine, it may be easier to think like you're training a dog. So in the first green concentric circle, the big circle, everything is encompassed in what we're calling artificial intelligence. So you may hear the term AI being thrown around a lot, but basically it's most basic general form of AI is just computing that is analogous to training a dog to obey some simple command like sit or fetch. Okay. So computer programmer gets the computer to perform a basic task that requires human-like intelligence. And then as we drill down a little bit more in the light blue circle, we have machine learning. So this, you can imagine this as like you are teaching your dog or a trainer is teaching a dog to fetch a package, for example, upon hearing a doorbell. So in machine learning, algorithms learn from the data and they adjust their actions, much like your dog might learn to hear that sound and then go retrieve the package. And then the dark blue circle, so a little bit more specific, is deep learning. And deep learning is, if you can imagine, training your dog to sort males. So males like bills or letters or junk. And maybe the dog is using scent or color cues. Deep learning in AI is like this. It utilizes complex neural networks, and you may have heard that term being thrown around a lot, to make a decision. So it's a neural network that acts much like the human brain to understand data. And then the smallest circle, and this is where we are focused today, is generative AI. And at this level, you can picture a dog being trained to bring you specific types of mail based on your mood. And so generative AI is similar in that it can create new contextually relevant data, just like a dog sorting mail according to your emotions. And so each stage represents an advancement in AI from basic programming to much more complex nuanced decision-making and data generation, but it's all built on fundamental AI principles. So that's where we're coming from. Now, within that generative AI idea, I want to think about how does a traditional chatbot create new text? And we've had chatbots for a long time, but ChatGPT, when it came out in November of 2022, made them accessible to most of the public. And so now we're we're all talking about this, but they've been around for a long time. And the technology really isn't new per se. It's just a predictive agent that allows the machine to use a, a, a language model. So a language model is just like a database, a huge conglomeration or a corpus of books, the whole web, for example, you know, whatever's in the web, blogs, articles, maybe recorded and transcribed scripts of TV, movies, who, who knows? We don't know, right? And that's part of the problem is that we don't always know what's in that language model. And so that's why I said earlier, biases can exist. And one thing that I'm really curious about as a corpus linguist is this idea of representativeness. Like if we don't know what's there, we don't know what the weighting of any of this information is in terms of topics. So we don't have to get into all that today, but I just wanted to kind of share how my background is relevant to this and, and why this became so interesting to me so quickly. So you have a sentence like the color of the sky is something and the machine is using lots and lots of algorithms. It's vectoring data. It's pulling out semantic patterns and eventually it comes up with some answer that is most likely to match 
all the previous patterns that are found in this language model. And it comes up with this blue for I mean, It could be dark, it could be cloudy, it could be anything, right? Depending on other context. So you wouldn't just have the color of the sky is, you know, you, you might have more context there. And then that word blue would change according to the additional context. In academic text, let's say you have a sentence like this, a study links B decline to greenhouse emissions. And the language model is thinking, well, what is most likely to come in an academic text after that? Well, it's probably going to be a citation, right? And so there it is it's going to probably hallucinate a citation. And so one of the things that we see happening is students are starting to ask faculty members about, you know, I can't find this source. I would like to read this source. I found it on ChatGPT. It's not in the database, Google Scholar, my library database. Where is it? Well, ChatGPT hallucinated it. And so you're not going to find it. But that's kind of how that works. So GPT-4, GPT-4 Turbo, or in terms of accuracy, they are the best in show, so to speak. But, you know, Llama and Anthropics, Claude, Mistral, some of the, you know, these aren't far behind. It's just that GPT-4 really stands out in this area. Now, that doesn't mean that it, you know, 3% is still something. And so we still have to watch out for it. Notice 3.5 is here, but we don't suggest using GPT-4. GPT 3.5, which is right now is the free version for academic purposes. It, it just doesn't have enough analytical power in its model to generate. I mean, if you if you use GPT 4 and you compare it to the output of GPT 3.5, you will immediately notice a difference. And so if you're using it for email, for you know, writing silly poems, even as a thesaurus to generate, you know, synonyms or something like that, it's fine. But in terms of really using it for more robust academic purposes, we don't recommend it. Okay, so we get a lot of questions when we do these professional developments about privacy. And so I just really quickly want to say, and this is related to OpenAI's ChatGPT, there is a way you can turn off the history and training. And so what that means is the chat history is, if you ever use GPT, on the left side of your screen will be your, your your chat history, your recorded conversations that you've had with the machine. And training means that anything that you add in there becomes then part of their next model or it becomes folded into the training, the machine's training. So if you want to avoid that, you can turn off chat history and training by going to your settings, which is at the lower left, going to data and controls. And then from there, clicking chat history and training to toggle off. Now that means you won't have anything saved. You won't be able to go back and look at those conversations. But if you are using data that you don't want in a history or you don't want to be part of their training, then th we get a lot of questions about this. And I don't think it's clear because it's kind of hidden. It's a hidden setting. So that's how you do that. Okay. Let's move on now to Prompt Engineering 101. I'm going to go over kind of some general best practices, give you some ideas and some examples, and we will share this PDF um, after the after the workshop. So generic higher ed use cases, you can think about kind of three buckets. So enhancing teaching practices, which might look like automated assessment and feedback or collaborative learning activities. That would be where the teacher is prompting the machine to come up with ideas. You could also explore student learning outcomes where you are maybe teaching your students to personalize their learning experiences and helping them understand how they can get better at complex cognitive tasks by scaffolding their thinking not with your own communication, but with them communicating or prompting an AI. And then the final bucket is supporting research endeavors. So for example, data collection analysis, lit review and synthesis, and we have a lot of videos. We have a YouTube site. We have many, many videos about literature review because that seems to be a really hot topic for faculty needing to support graduate students and graduate students needing to support themselves. It's a hard kind of gatekeeping task in grad school. And so we have lots of other videos on that. I won't focus on that today because obviously we are talking about prompting. 
So I'm going to now shift to what is a prompt? What is prompt engineering and why does it matter? So if we think about a world where we're going to look here first, let's imagine that you have a, a researcher who has a purpose statement. They're working on a purpose statement for a manuscript or a graduate student working on a dissertation or thesis, and they need to improve this purpose statement because it's a really central aspect of their study. And so they give the bot the purpose statement they have drafted, and they say, help me improve this purpose statement. And then what does that bot do? It just outputs a better version of that purpose statement by enhancing it, adding some details. It sounds very, very confident. It always sounds good. But what does the student really learn at this point? And then are they going to copy and paste it and put it directly into their work? This raises a lot of ethical questions. Maybe they're able to look at this and deduce what is happening here. What were the improvements? Maybe not. We don't really know. It's just a gimme. It's just a giveaway, right? So once we know how to do more structured prompting, we can start to get feedback like this. So this is an example of one of our tools. We have a purpose statement tool that in our, in at Academic Insight Labs in our suite. And we have given through prompting, through doing the prompting for the student, we've given a framework for what should an effective purpose statement look like. Well, it should have a method, it should have variables, it should have a specific population, and it should have setting. Moreover, we have told the machine to use these red and green little icons and to use markdown, which is like bolding, headings, bullets, that kind of thing, to make it more reader friendly. So you can see, even though this is small and maybe hard to see, it's it's definitely more reader friendly and it looks more like a textbook, honestly, than this does. So once you learn how to do this kind of prompting, you really can get much, much better output that can educate the student. This is what we want. This is a desired for ourselves and for our students. This is where we want to be. And I'll just add to that because, you know, I started building these tools for my students. I teach and what I learned is that my students, you know, were using chat GPT. I gave them permission. I have a pretty open policy as long as they tell me how they're using it. And what I learned through them was that when they get like what you see on the left, the reality, even if their intention is not to cheat or cut corners because they don't know how to prompt correctly, when chat GPT or any large language model just starts rewriting it for them, it gives them a lot of anxiety because they can't unsee that. And then they just don't want to use it at all. And so that was a big part of my motivation for building these tools was to give tools to my students so that they don't have to learn how to prompt and have a prompt library so that they could get feedback on assignments before they submit them to me because they were terrified of using these tools and then seeing this and then not being able to unsee it. And then they were worried about like plagiarism. And so that's also just something you need to be thinking about as faculty. Just wanted to throw that in there. Thanks. Yes. The, unsee the problem of not being able to unsee something once you've seen it and the worry that am I doing something wrong? Because as you well know, universities are not, they don't, they haven't, most of them haven't made policies about this. It's a teacher led policy. Okay. So prompt design questions. The main three things that we want to see in a good effective prompt is role and goal, context and output. So the questions that we've added here are designed to help you to think about what you want to write to that machine uh, as you're designing a prompt. So role and goal. Two things with role. What expertise should the AI use in its response? So act as an expert in disciplinary academic writing education, you know, whatever you want it to act as is the first role. And the other part of that is who is the target audience? So if you know anything about rhetoric, I mean, this is just basic rhetorical situation, author, audience, and then we're going to get to purpose in just a minute, but this is just rhetorical situation, the rhetorical triangle. And then goal, what process or special insights do you want the machine to use? So if they're an expert in disciplinary academic writing, for example, that specializes in STEM, STEM-based practices or engineering or something like that. You want to give it those two things first. Then context. So the setting, the interaction, the task, what is the human asking for? And what is the context that is 
basically surrounding that situation. And then third is output. Output is what do you want to see the machine generate? So there's two things to think about here, form and function. And so this is something linguists use, but I think it's very relevant here. Form is just like, what is the actual physical way it should look? Is it going to be paragraphs? Is it going to have headings? Is it going to be a table? Is it going to have bullets? Or is there some other thing that you're envisioning? I think eventually we will have generative AI that can output graphs and charts and that kind of thing for us. I mean, right now, these they can there's some add-ons, some plugins you can get that do that, but they're not they're not great. But they can do tables really well. They do bullets, they do headings. I mean, this is all called markdown, and you can say to any chatbot, use Markdown in your in your output, and it will know that it means these things. Or you can be even more specific, like, I want a bulleted list. I don't want the bullets to be complete sentences. Make them phrases or make it appropriate for a PowerPoint presentation, something like that. And then function is like communicative goal. So is this supposed to be formal, informal, persuasive, informational, argumentative there. And we could go on and on. These are just a few examples of what is the actual communicative goal that is going to happen again between the, the, the roles and the context. So this is, those are the basic three. And now what we're going to do is um, show you an example of that and sort of build on it moving forward into different types of prompts. Okay, so here's uh, the prompt that we're going to be working with, and we've got these color-coded role, context, and output sections. So role. I like to start with act as a professor. Some people use imagine. Some people use you are a. Some people say I am a. I think pronouns get really confusing, so I suggest act as. Act as a professor conducting a study on student acceptance of te technological tools for automated writing evaluation. Now the tool knows what it's doing and implied there is, you know, my role is probably this professor. And then context, the primary question driving the study is, and then you tell it all the things you need, the sub questions, they, this, this prompter says use a modified version of the TAM model and then some more details there about what that model includes. But practical, very seminal model, models like, like TAM, even if you're not familiar with that, usually these large language models know that model and, and they're familiar with it. But you, you want to make sure, and I'll, I'll say more about that later. And then output. Develop a list of interview questions and output the questions as a table with category in the left and examples in the right and use an informational tone. So that is just a good, solid, basic structure for prompt. Role, goal, context, and output. What we have to remember is that this same computer science principle, garbage in, garbage out, or GIGO, is exactly what's happening. If the input is erroneous, inaccurate, homogenous, unfilled, any of those things, then the output is going to reflect that, right? And so we already don't know what's happening in that language model. The only thing we can really control is what we prompt in the input. So that's why this is so important to get the output that we want. Okay, most common types of prompting. We're going to talk through four, and then after that, I'm going to give a few like kind of extra add-ons. Remembering that role context and output happens no matter what type of prompt it is. This is the template, the standard. These are the types. So a zero shot prompt is when you make a request and you have no examples of style, structure, or content. It's just a very no frills kind of prompt. So just depending on your use case, if you know, if you if you're in a hurry, for example, maybe a zero shot prompt, or if it's not something high stakes, you might want to use a zero shot prompt, but you're not really giving that much information to the machine. So this is a zero shot prompt, the one that we just went over. This is exactly what that looks like. And, you know, it's still long. I mean, so you're, you got to do some work to get the benefit of, of good output, even in a zero shot prompt. And so then let's step it up a bit. A one shot prompt is when you make a request with one example of style structure or content. So you just give one example. Essentially, zero means zero examples and one means one example. 
So now what we've done is we've added to the end of this prompt an example where we just literally say, for example, for the construct perceived usefulness, that's one of the that's one of the constructs in the TAM model. Perceived usefulness, an interview question might be, how do you find the technology useful in improving your writing skills? And so that gives the machine a little bit more of an idea about what you're expecting in the output. And then the next type is few shot prompting. So this label to me is a little bit deceiving. Few means like a few. So basically it means a request with two or more examples. So zero shot, zero examples. One shot, one example. Few shot, two or more examples of style, structure, or content. So this is a very developed prompt that might look something like this. Again, role context output, always the same. Here, we've got two examples, but we could have had three or 10. And the other thing you can think about doing is you can often ask for the examples in a separate prompt and then weave together your previous prompting with the final output that you want to get. So this is iterative. It doesn't typically happen all at once, especially if you're working on something high stakes. And then the last official type of prompt that I want to talk about is chain of thought prompting. This is where you guide the AI to break down the tasks into smaller steps or considerations before it reaches a conclusion or generates an output. So it's a chain of thought or a chain of steps, procedures. So in this case, we have the role, we have the context, and the rest is built in here to instructions. So to develop interview questions for a study on this TAM model, here are the steps you need to take. First, identify the construct. Then for each construct, think about the how it relates to student experiences. Based on that analysis, so see how it feeds on each other? So it's building. Number two, assumes number one, number three assumes number two. So it's that chain of thought that happens, prompting the machine to really think carefully. And I'm using these verbs like think, say, it, it's not actually thinking and saying, but I'm just using those because it's the easiest way to talk about it. Here's an example of the remainder of that chain of thought prompt where the output is listed and then the examples. So this is a, really, this is a few shot chain of thought prompt. Okay. So as I said, we have to expect that this is iterative. Basically, what you're doing with, a mach with this machine is you are negotiating meaning. And this is part of second language learning. This is that term comes from second language learning, where a learner negotiates with another interlocutor to get an outcome. In this case, our outcome is some output, some desired output. But really, you're just trying to figure out how much the machine is uptake what you're saying. So you've got to directly call out errors. You have to emphasize ignored directives or instructions, break down complexity into steps. So chain of thought is really useful for that. And then you're going to have to iterate and reiterate and ask again and build up and then come back to it. And it's going to be a back and forth thing. It is not this easy one and done kind of process. It takes some thought. It takes some practice. And I think once you think of it as a negotiation, it will help you to think of it more like a human. You're going to get better output if you think about it like a human and not like a machine. And then from there, you have to trust but verify. So you want to assume that mostly it's probably right. If you're using GPT-4, for example, we had that 97% accuracy rate, right? 3% hallucination rate. But depending on your topic, if there's not something in that model that can inform that output, you're more likely to get a hallucination. So if you're talking about academic topics where they're very sophisticated and nuanced, you may get hallucinations. So you want to trust but verify. Now, you're all faculty, you're experts in your field, students are not. So they need guidance in this. And this is where those AI literacies come into place that I started with. So really teaching them how the model works, how the predictive language functions, and then showing them how to go back and check the literature or just check with their human sense of reason. Reason. Trust but verify is a is a great is a great way to do that. Okay, so speaking of ethical considerations and trust, let's talk through this. So there's kind of three buckets or categories of concern here: bias in prompt design and in AI outputs, 
fairness. So addressing the importance of fairness and representativeness in the AI response and in your input, your prompt, and then privacy. So as I started with, with, with GPT-4, you can turn that chat history and training off. I'm, I use Claude a lot. And now I'm wondering, Jessica, do you know, can you turn the chat history and training off with Claude? I'm not sure. Me either, because I never use it for academic purposes. I only use it for, like I said that in the chat, I only use it when I'm trying to like refine an email or something mm-hmm. that's really low stakes where I don't worry about privacy. And that, so that's not even something I've investigated, but I will investigate it while we're in this webinar and I'll get back okay, to Okay, thanks. Yeah, so those are kind of three categories you really want to think about. And if again, if you're doing AI literacy training with your students, you know, this is, these are things to consider and have discussions around because the reality is this is an emergent field. I mean, it's, it's really not an, of course, AI has been around for a long time, but as I said, with the advent of chat GPT in November, 2022, we all got access to this. And so it's emergent in the public sphere and, and there are not best practices. And, you know, we, we need thought leaders in the higher education space who are willing to say, here's what I think is a best practice and put it out there because people don't know. And, you know, we're just all putting our heads together to try to understand and apply what we know and kind of, you know, further further the discussion a little bit as we can. Okay, something to think about also is that there are types of misuse. There are unethical uses and then there are misguided uses. So these are more obvious. I'm going to start here. Unethical is when you know uh, you violate some moral standard or code or maybe a legal regulation. An example of that would be like falsifying or manipulating data or not checking for linguistic or cultural biases or just dis- you know disclosing sensitive or private data, people's names. I mean, if you think about what a nightmare this is going to be for the IRB eventually for people who work with IRB they really are going to have to be at the center of these kinds of discussions. Those are the more obvious unethical uses. But then we have some kind of grayer areas where the use is just misguided. So this is when we employ AIs for tasks where it's unreliable or it's inaccurate because we don't have that literacy we need in place. And so we're using it in a way that just doesn't align with what it's good at. So an example of that would be like over relying on automation. If you're, you know, the more you're using it, you're going to start seeing more hallucinations because, you know, you're going to, you're increasing the amount of use. So you're going to be noticing that in terms of academic writing, there are lots of gray areas. You know, is this plagiarism? If you ask a tool to write something and then you populate that or you repurpose that directly as your own writing without saying, I used AI partially to generate this, you know, is that plagiarism or not? We even have a term now, post-plagiarism. If you follow Sarah Eaton work, she's a Canadian researcher. She's really prominent in this field of higher education integrity. Another misguided use is using AI instead of your critical thinking skills that only a human can do right now. So a lot of this is over-reliance or substitution. If you're using a chatbot, I have AI, but what I am intending here is a chatbot as a sole research tool, then that is a misguided use of it. There are lots of databases that are layered on top of language models that are using like semantic scholar or open access publications alongside language models. So some some examples are illicit, site, research rabbit. There, there are several others where they will use the power of a large language model and a database of real research to help you get a better finding in terms of citations and looking for literature. But if you're using ChatGPT, that's a misguided use and you're going to get hallucinations. And then if you're if you're just accepting the output as well, true, valid, reliable, <laughs> um, that's misguided. We know that these models hallucinate. We have to be diligent about the criticism. Okay. A recent article, so this came out Frontiers, and this is a medical journal, but I really recommend this article because it's the, it's really, other than what comes from publishers, this comes directly from academics. 
This is recommendations for explaining AI's role in academic writing. And in this article, they give best practices. They basically give a framework for how to do this. These are the best practices. And they give you an actual, some linguistic resources, words, phrases, sentences to use for how you've used it. Basically though, you want to explain it straightforward way, keep and report the human in the loop. How did you stay in the loop as the human? Share the tools that you used. So if you used GPT-4, say GPT-4, don't say chat GPT. Does that mean the free version 3.5? Does that mean four? What version is it? Just like if you were to use S or in vivo, you would say which version of the software it is. You want to treat it like that. Put ethics first, especially right now in this time of like emerging policy. We have to really keep this at the forefront. Admit suboptimal outcomes. So if something happened and you, you know, it, it didn't work like you thought it would work, then you need to admit that. And then disclose conflicts of interest. I mean, some of those are just best practices in general for acknowledging help you get outside of your own human brain when you are writing up research. Here's their example. This came straight from that article. So we have the source down here, the citation. This is what they suggest for if you have used AI in the drafting of an article. So if you have actually used it to ideate and change words around and think through syntax and that sort of thing, they give you this. And it goes one through six, addressing basically those six bullet points on the previous slide. This is how you do it in the writing itself. Additional resources. Ethan Mollock is a wonderful researcher to follow if you're on LinkedIn. He posts almost daily. I have learned so much just from following him on LinkedIn, reading his work, and then looking at who he is recommending. But he has a, and this is something that they update frequently. Actually, I think it was last revised in January of this year. Seven approaches for students with prompts. It might even be more than seven at this point. Um, he and his wife keep this pretty updated and and this is a great open access paper that you where you can read about using prompts for students. This is a very, very new article. It's still in preprint with three kind of new types of prompting or very sophisticated types of prompting. I won't say much about it, but meta language creation, and this would work really well if you were a researcher saying, when I use the term X, so quantum mechanics, I don't know, interpret it as whatever you are using as your definition. And then once you tell the machine that, it has that working knowledge to, to then continue. Reflection. So after generating a summary of X, reflect on this and identify any potential inaccuracies or areas that require further clarification. So when you prompt something, you're obviously going to leave some things out just because you're human and you can't think of everything. And if you ask the AI to then go back and look for inaccuracies or areas that are kind of gaps in the knowledge space there, then you can get a lot of really good stuff, really good output that, and you may not have thought of it. And then the last one is cognitive verifier. So this is when you generate, you ask the AI to generate additional questions or considerations based on some initial query. And then you ask it to combine those answers to provide a comprehensive analysis of the topic. So again, this can't be done in one prompt. This is going to be an iterative negotiated interaction between you and the machine where you ultimately come up with some output that is the final kind of decision or say. And I've linked that article there as well. And now I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jessica and let her demo a tool. Excuse me. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. This won't take long. We're just going to give you a sense of like what this looks like in, in practice. You know, some people want to keep a library of prompts. I know colleagues who do that. And then some people don't. They would rather just use a tool for a specific use case. So here's just an, an example of how we apply those prompts on the back end of AI tools in order to get the sort of output you're looking for. And so this specific tool that we have is called the Literature Review Copilot. It does a lot of things. I'm going to show you the main menu. I'm going to zoom in. And so these are essentially separate AI tools with completely different prompts built into each menu item. And so let's say I want feedback on my entire lit review. I'm going to upload a document. Just give me one second to do that. 
And then it's going to generate output based on how we prompted it to work. And so we gave it, you know, criteria for many aspects of synthesis, you know, what you would expect in a well-written lit review. And this particular tool is for grad students. We also have the same type of tool for folks writing manuscripts like yourself, your faculty, since we I have mostly faculty here with us today. But we do the same thing for manuscripts. Obviously, a lit review section and manuscript is much shorter than a lit review that a student would write. But yeah, this is what it does. And it just takes all of that, that we combine all different types of prompt strategies, de depending on the use case in order for it to give feedback. And so our tools are very different than, you know, say an, another company where, you know, you would use it to just do it for you. We're really about education first AI. And so we don't build our tools to just do it for you. We use our tools as like coaching and educational tools, which is partly why faculty love us because they would rather our, our students, you know, their students use our tools instead of this. And so if you want to learn through the process and not just use something to do it for you, then tools like ours are the way to go. And you can just click next. And then we remind everyone that this is a chat bot and you can then just chat with it just like you would chat GPT because this has GPT-4 Turbo on the back end. And again, the difference is GPT-4 and GPT-4 Turbo. The difference is GPT-4 Turbo has a large context window. And so it's much more appropriate when you're feeding it longer documents, like the types of documents we tend to work on in academic context. And so that's why GPT-4 Turbo is really helpful to have in these types of scenarios. And so that's just one example of how like all of that prompting can come together, either you doing it on your own or using a tool like ours or someone else's who's done the prompting for you in order to give you this much more useful structured output. So yeah, that was our Lit Review Copilot. We have like 11 minutes. Let's open up the floor for questions. I to draw attention to, I believe it was Nick asked a really good question about, do you require, if, if, if 3.5 is not good for academics, then you require your students uh, buy it. No, I, we don't. What we do is we have an enterprise account. We create application layers on top of these models. We're model agnostic, but we, but we add an application layer. And so we have created a, a membership tier for students that is only $9 a month. And we have a chat bot that functions as Claude. And we have a chat bot that functions as GPT-4 Turbo, which is what Jessica was talking about, that doesn't have much prompting on the back end. And so they can use it pretty much as they, well, exactly as they can, GPT-4 yeah. or Claude 2.1 without those limitations imposed by, by the company. Yeah, and it might if you were to compare it though, we we we'd have given it like a general prompting framework to tell it what the academic context is. So it wouldn't be just like going into you might notice that its tone and the type of feedback it gives would be different than just going into GPT-4 and OpenAI and that's because people who use our tools are academics and so we've given it like an initial prompt to tell it you know, that its role is in uh, an academic coach and mentor and that the user is in an academic environment, whether it be a graduate student or a faculty member. And so you'll notice that it will conversate with you differently than, say, just going into chat GPT and using their version of GPT-4. But it's the same model on the back end. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the in the chat and we'll address them as they come. So just to clarify, it's nine dollars for the a single subscription, and then we could share out a bot with our students and they wouldn't have to pay an additional nine dollars. Yeah, so no, that that's a good question. So yeah. every addition like every person's membership would be nine dollars, but this is what we currently do. Yeah. Like we do partnerships with faculty in their classrooms where uh -huh. we get very big discounts. So if okay. you have 50 students in your classroom, then we could work out a partnership where maybe it's only four dollars a student. Okay. So like much more affordable because we want the we really believe in accessibility and we do not want I mean, obviously we're a business. We have to make money in some ways. Oh, yeah. We do discount them quite heavily when we partner yeah. with faculty if they want to offer the tools to their students. And so okay. we have yeah, several partnerships right now where their students are accessing them for as little as like even two to four dollars a month, depending on the number of students. Yeah. And the, the tools are like transferable across classes too, ultimately. So, yeah, and, yeah, and right, we're bringing out more co-pilots that would allow the student to like upload the rubric 
for example. So they don't have to use the criteria that we use to program the tool. They could say, well, this is the rubric for the assignment. I want to get feedback on how well I'm doing before I submit this. So get some formative feedback from the tool by giving it the exact rubric that they would like to be graded on. You know, that's how I have my students use it too. Like my expectation is that they've gone through two iterations before they submit to me. And then I have them do like a self-reflection paper to see what they learned from the feedback. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. This recording and everything will go out. Just give us like 24 hours and we'll get it on YouTube and then we'll send everyone the slide deck as well. I would just be curious to hear from people here because I know we have a range of folks like in terms of, you know, maybe you haven't even used chat GPT. Maybe you've only used it for personal reasons or maybe some of you have started, you know, are super users. I'd just be curious to hear about any scenarios, like we really try to learn from these conversations. Like if there's something that you feel like we didn't touch on or uh, an experience you've had yourself or with a student that you think would be useful to share with the group, then feel free to comment or share in the chat because this is all moving very quickly. And the way we learn is having these conversations with people. Thanks for visiting our YouTube channel. If you have thoughts or questions, drop us a comment below. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, subscribe for more insights, and ring the bell so you never miss a video.